Officially, good morning and uh, happy Palm Sunday and um, welcome to Midtown Collective. Uh, this week we are going to be discussing Luke 1, 26 through 38. And um, I will kick us off with prayer and then we'll dig into some scripture. Let us pray. God, we come before you just thanking you um, for the awesome day and the amazing and beautiful weather that we've been having. Um, I pray that you use this time um, to enlighten us, uh, give us a different perspective or um, inform us in a different way um, and prepare our hearts as we go into a discussion um, around um, this passage. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to continue to come together and bless this time. And we ask this in your holy and mighty name. Amen. All right. Um, I will kick off and go ahead and tell you that um, Luke is one of my favorites of the four Gospels. And um, this one was a really interesting uh, passage. Uh, it's not going to come to any surprise to anyone when we're talking about Mary learning uh, that she is going to be um, with child. But um, I will start by reading uh, Luke 1, 26 through 38. Uh, this is the CEV uh, version. And it says, one month later, God sent the angel Gabriel to the town of Nazareth in Galilee with a message for a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to Joseph from the family of King David. The angel greeted Mary and said, you are truly blessed. The Lord is with you. Mary was confused by the angel's words and wondered what they meant. Then the angel told Mary, don't be afraid. God is pleased with you and you will have a son. His name will be Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of God most high. The Lord God will make him king and his ancestor, or like his, as his ancestor David was. There we go. He will rule the people of Israel forever and his kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I'm not even married. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come down to you and God's power will come over you. So your child will be called the Holy Son of God. Your relative Elizabeth is also going to have a son, even though she is old. No one thought she could ever have a baby, but in three months, she will have a son. Nothing is impossible for God. Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it happen as you have said. And the angel left her. So if you look at the, the time, um, right now we're about nine months before what we would traditionally uh, consider a Christmas holiday. So um, that is why I chose this particular scripture, but it's also very fitting that we are going into uh, this being Palm Sunday and we're going into Holy Week. And Easter, of course, is next week. So I thought this was a really good time to dig into this uh, text and uh, look at a few things that contextually were going on and also um, look at what, um, what, what we can learn from Mary as well as what we can learn from what the angel was saying about God um, in, in this text. And so a, a few things um, to, to keep into context. Uh, number one, uh, just a few verses before this, um, Elizabeth is, um, Elizabeth and her husband, Zacharias, are, are discussed, and um, Elizabeth was very old um, and had been deemed barren for many years, and it was um, one of the, uh, I would say, um, one of the senses or cases of embarrassment for Zacharias, because as a priest in the um, Jewish faith and in the Jewish temple, uh, him continuing the name is is of importance. Um, so I, I think that that was something that that he saw as a disappointment, and uh, he, you know, then learns that his wife is going to be with child, uh, and you know, there's all sorts of, of fun um, story that goes behind that. And I do recommend uh, digging into the the verses before this, as well as verses a little bit beyond this um, that. Um, give you more insight into what was going on with Zacharias and Elizabeth. Um, but in looking at what we can glean from this particular passage, number one, what a day for Mary. Um, if you consider just what was happening in her life, she's recently betrothed. Uh, P.S. and by the way, she's in her early teens. So you have someone who is a, a pretty young um, girl. It could be as she could have been as early as 12, um, who has recently been betrothed uh, to Joseph. So I'm sure that this is a big conversation to have and a lot of, um, you know, what in the heck is going on and and what's, why is this happening, etc. Um, 
a, a little bit about the with the Jewish faith and contextually what was happening in that in that time. Um, a betrothal was a it was a legal contract, so she was legally um, in in the eyes of the law. She was basically wed to Joseph, and so had something happened to Joseph before they were married, she would have been considered a virgin widow. Uh, so it was a really important um, agreement that the two families had. And so her, you know, finding out that she is with child and is supposed to be a virgin bride, of course, is going to cause great um, consternation or could have caused great consternation. Um, so, I'm sure that that is weighing heavily on her mind as she is having this conversation with Gabriel. And last, you know, all of the, the politics aside and her very young age aside, put yourself in her shoes for just a second and imagine that you are so favored by God that you have been chosen to give birth to, quote, son of God most high. Uh, and do that in your early teens and see if you don't have you know, uh, an oh my goodness moment. Um, I, I, when I, when I stopped and thought about that, I thought, okay, you know, she's asking all sorts of really good questions, but then I'm thinking, holy cow, to be, to be a person who has all of this particular life planned out for her, marrying Joseph, uh, you know, and thinking that life is going to happen in A, B, and C, um, and then for all of that to change so drastically, so quickly with one conversation with an angel learning that, you know, she is going to be the mother of our savior. Uh, to me, that's just incredibly awe-inspiring. And I think that she handled it um, much better than many people would. And to do so at a very early age is just incredibly um, interesting uh, to me. In looking a little bit further and starting to think about what I pulled away from this in relation to what God says, this was my immediate reaction was just mind blown because <laughs> between Mary's response, between Gabriel coming in, between um, all of what was happening, I just had my oh my goodness moment and then started um, thinking through of what we can what we can take away from that and and what we can look at today um so what i pulled away from this from mary specifically is she asked questions and she wanted to get more insight she wanted to learn more and you know there are multiple verses where god tells us to to test to ask and to research to study to show ourselves approved so you know often when you look at the way that, um, or at least the way that I've that I was raised, especially in a very conservative church, um, in many in many cases we were taught not to ask questions. That what the pastor says is A, B, and C, and that's just the way that it is. And so this reminded me that we should constantly be asking questions and constantly pouring over scripture and um, and referencing um, what's going on in our life in our prayers to. Uh, to understand if if we are following God's will, and if in fact the the thoughts that we are getting are from are from God, and and um, so for me the asking of questions I thought was really important and was beneficial that 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 was in the scripture. Um, going a little bit further, Mary did seek clarity, and she started. I'm not going to say she pushed back, but she did say, you know, I'm betrothed. How can I be a virgin wife or a virgin bride? Uh, and be having a baby. So she was trying to get as much clarity from Gabriel as she could. And I think that that was incredibly helpful as well um, to, to start thinking through how, how these changes happen and, and what impacts these decisions are going to make. The third piece that, that I found, um, I, I think, sweet and, and also inspiring at the same time was it was, it was just amazing faith that such a young woman has uh, to be visited by an angel, be told that she's going to, um, you know, be giving birth to a child. She has, she is still pure and P.S. and by the way, it is the son of God most high. So her faith is definitely going to be tested in that, but at the same time, uh, she, she was okay and, and she was, she was ready for that. Uh, so I, I, I took 
you know, my learning from, from her part of this uh, passage as really inspiring. I, I then turned that around a little bit and, and started, at, you know, thinking through um, what I learned from God and about God uh, in this same passage. And the first thing that I, I looked at was number one, nothing is impossible for God and, and for him because um, A, he is not only giving a, a virgin, a, a child. Um, number two, he is giving a woman who has been deemed barren for many decades uh, a child. So he's overcoming all sorts of obstacles. And, you know, it's, I think, or at least in my life, I take for granted um, the just awesomeness of who God is and what he can do. Uh, yesterday when I was sitting outside, I was watching the moon come up and I was thinking, you know, all of this is happening and, and all of this that we call creation around us um, is everything that, that God created. And so it was, it was nice to see just such a, an easy reminder, especially this week as we're going into Holy Week, what, um, what it's going to look like. And, uh, you know, as, as we're continuing through, this is really the beginning of, of what the story of Christ is, is becoming um, with this discussion with um, Gabriel and Mary, but then it's also a promise from the Old Testament. So, you know, this is just fulfilled prophecy that we can keep going through uh, and, and all of it is interwoven and, and together. Number two is, I thought it was interesting that there was such a specific call out for, uh, for Mary to know that Elizabeth was also with child. And in the beginning, I, you know, I've, I've overlooked that dozens of times uh, in my reading and, and just thought about, okay, you know, we've, we've got this discussion with Zacharias and, and Elizabeth, and then we're going into the discussion of Mary and, you know, these are prophecies fulfilled, et cetera. But what I, what I really stopped to think about was God created a support system for Mary in this discussion by letting her know that Elizabeth is also having a miracle birth, very different, but a, a miracle birth all the same. And so he created this system of support for Mary going into this because each woman is going to have a different experience, but at least they can lean on each other and at least they can have the support of each other through this very trying time. The last learning or, um, or thought that I had out of this particular passage was that, you know, in all of this and in all of the, the passage, God removed multiple obstacles and created solutions. You know, if you think about the contractual obligation that Mary and Joseph had, uh, Joseph could have broken off the, the engagement and she would have been a, a shamed woman and all of these moving parts and pieces could have and would have happened as a result of that. But God was working in all of those moving parts and pieces to remove the obstacles, create solutions both for Mary and softening Joseph's heart and helping Zacharias and Elizabeth through all of this. So to me, it was just such an awesome reminder of the ability that God has to look much more broadly than we ever can and, and start piecing these, you know, really intricate webs and stories together um, to help us throughout our life. And it, to me, the, you know, these, these three major pieces of the learnings from this week's passage, um, specifically from God, as I'm going into Holy Week, just reminds me of who he is and what he does and can do, while also making me incredibly grateful for the remembrance of what we're walking into uh, this week with Holy Week. Uh, so I was excited by the passage. Um, I will say I've read it dozens, if not hundreds of times in my life and took away many new thoughts and new ideas and was also just completely blown away that all of this was resting on the shoulders of a, you know, possibly 12 year old girl who um, was going to be absolutely responsible for our savior <laughs> um, at such a young age. So it was, it was exciting and just made me realize how stressed out I get about some things and 
that you know this 12 year old kid's taking care of much more than I ever would have uh, dreamed of. So that was my, my thought on um, this particular passage going into Holy Week and the discussion around Mary and a um, divine and virgin birth. So that was my thoughts on it. Does anyone have anything that you would like to add or questions, um, insights or anything else? If so, please chime in at any time um, because this one was an exciting, an exciting passage for me. I was thinking, I was wondering if Mary might've been just a little bit more well taught so far as Old Testament scripture was concerned. Uh, I think about how girls are treated education-wise in the Middle East, and I don't know how it was back in those days, but you think she probably had a better um, uh, frame of reference of scripture, too. Right, absolutely. And, you know, while there wasn't the, um, the probably ready availability to the written text, um, given her lineage, I'm sure that there were always discussions that, you know, a savior would come and she was a, she was part of that lineage, but um, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. She probably did have some knowledge of it. Um, I would just be asking God, why now, you know, with Gabriel, I'm, I'm 12 years old. Can't we make this a little bit easier? But um, she, she continued on. She had the faith, faith to do it, which to me was exciting. Right, what I'm thinking, without that basic right. uh, knowledge of scripture, she would have had a panic attack, I would think. At least I would, not <laughs> having knowledge. Exactly. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm 41 now, and I wouldn't want to take this on. <laughs> well, what a fantastic thing, uh, instance, uh, a fantastic day, the, the fantastic revelation to her. Um, the thoughts that, that just jumped out from your presentation to me is asking the question, well, Mary became revered and famous. Mm -hmm. what, what, what did it grow from? What was her history? Do we know anything more about her until this uh, scripture? Uh, does anyone have history uh, beyond uh, of those 12 years? Right. Um, I'll, I'll dig in and I'll, I'll circle back with you on that because yes, there is information, but I want to make sure that I'm, I'm concise in it and um, can circle back with you. But yeah, I think that that's a really good, uh, a good call out and a good question. Given her lineage uh, and, and her heritage, um, I, I think that there is quite a bit of info, info um, but um, at the same time, you know, we, we really haven't I never dug in to looking at um, Joseph's background and who he was, but in, in doing some, some data diving this week, um, you know, it, we know that Joseph was a good bit older. It looks like he was actually quite a bit older uh, than, than Mary. Um, so I, I found that to be interesting just given the contractual obligations because, you know, we look at, at marriage today as, um, between two loving people, whereas that was very much a, it, it was a property play in many ways. Um, and, you know, the betrothal came with a lot of um, land or with um, livestock, et cetera. So it wasn't just, you know, that, that Mary and Joseph had fallen in love and, and they were going to, to make a, a happy life together. There was, there was a lot riding on this. So for, Joseph to continue down the path of marriage, I, I think is also interesting. But, you know, going back to the history and the, the knowledge that we have of Mary, I'll circle back with you on that one, Dan. Mm -hmm. Hey, Josh, it's Ron. Hi, Ron. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, in, your, in your research, and I'd love to walk that path with you, um, I am, just to share with everyone, I am um, Catholic <laughs> in family background. So um, there's a lot of Mary there. <laughs> and um, Josh and I often have very fun, and I'm, I'm, I'm being sarcastic when I say fun conversations 
around uh, the Immaculate Conception and what that actually means. And the fact that it means that Mary was conceived herself without sin. That's, that's the concept. So her parents were uh, Joachim and Anne. And uh, so there was, for, Josh and I kind of argue a little bit about the, the validity of the Immaculate Conception uh, as a concept and a theory, but what I love and take away from the whole thing is how God sort of, uh, he, he started his plan for our salvation in so many ways and well before he got to the Annunciation and actually saying that Mary would be the birth vessel for our Savior. And this is just what you were talking about, Josh, how God is so omniscient and omnipresent and has the power to set things up and remove obstacles and prepare a way for both John and Elizabeth and Mary and Jesus. And it's, it's, um, I, this is just one of my favorite, uh, parts of the Bible to study. Yes. And, and I will echo the fact that Ron and I have had many, um, I will say lively discussions <laughs> about scripture um, and, and specifically with this particular um, text and, and area of um, biblical history. So I, um, which I'm grateful for. Um, and uh, yes, uh, Kevin, I, I agree with you um, that we can agree to disagree and still love each other through it all. Um, there are times where we have said we're not going to change each other's minds. Um, they're made up, but we'll keep going. But I, I appreciate and value the dialogue and, and value the conversation because it makes me smarter, uh, which is why I love um, digging in each week on these scriptures and, and bringing you what I've what I've gleaned from it, uh, but at the same time, um, I love it when everyone can can also dig in and, and see, you know, what what God's put on your heart about the scripture and about these passages and what your interpretation of it is. Um, because unfortunately, while we have a ton of historical data, um, there are so many things that we don't have enough information on to really understand the historical context of what was happening and. Um, and what those moving parts and pieces would look like today. So I, I always value the inputs and opinions of everyone on the call. Uh, and if you uh, are so inclined uh, to dig in um, on next week's uh, passage, which is going to be Acts 10, 34 through 43, um, then you can come with all sorts of fun ideas as well. And we can continue this, this conversation. Uh, anything else does, that anyone wants to add? All righty. Well, with that, I will close us. Uh, as always, I appreciate the time and uh, that everyone has given me and um, given each of us on the call. And I will close us in prayer and then stop the recording. And if anyone has anything that they want to um, discuss afterward, then I will be more than happy to do so. So with that, let us pray. God, thank you for um, the remembrance of this week and, and what it means to, uh, to us individually, what it means to us as a group and a collective and what it means to us as your church. Um, I pray that you remind us consistently of, um, of the sacrifices that have been made and are continuing to be made for us. I pray that you uh, remind us to love each other and um, continue to make the world around us better um, in every possible way. I pray that you um, bless us this week, keep us safe, um, and keep us free from harm, and return us next week to continue learning and discussing um, who you are and your awesomeness. We ask this in your holy and mighty name. Amen. Amen.